Hello there, I'd like to welcome you to the online service for Hillbank Church. My name is Neil Martin. I'm one of the members at the church here. And as you can see, I'm not actually at the church building. I'm in my daughter's bedroom, which explains why Peter Rabbit is looming above me. In normal circumstances, we would be meeting at our building on Cotton Road in the Hilltown Dundee. But of course, we're not yet in normal circumstances. And so we continue with these online services. We do hope that this one will be a blessing to you, regardless as to whether you're joining us for the first time or indeed if you're one of our regulars tuning in. Although we're not yet able to meet at our building, we are now able to run Bible studies from our church building that meet respectively at half 11 and four o'clock on a Sunday. And if you are interested in coming along, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Please do get in touch at our Facebook page and um, our email address is there as well. If you do get in touch, we will organise for you to come along. For the purpose of this service, I'd like to begin with a quote from a well-known Christian writer by the name of C.S. Lewis, whom I'm sure many of you will be familiar. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilizations. These are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. What C.S. Lewis is touching upon there is the reality that we are very different from other animals, creatures that inhabit this earth in one key respect. Whereas those will live and die their lives and that will be that. We will live and die, but will live beyond death. We are in fact eternal beings with souls. Alongside that, the reality that there is a spiritual realm that we cannot discern with the naked eye, but is yet not to be discounted on that basis. We're now actually going to have a hymn from the praise band, a Getty's hymn called By Faith. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. After this hymn, we'll have our first Bible reading from Fina Bremner, and then we'll have intercessory prayer with Kenny Hanna.
chapter 4 verses 16 to 18 from the NIV version. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Good morning, everybody. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, gracious God, I lift up the people of Dundee, and I lift up their mental health, Lord, and I lift up the employment situation. I lift up the schools, especially for the safety of the teachers and the children who are attending. I also lift up the people who will be struggling with fuel poverty, People who would really want to get out at this time of year, to go to public buildings like libraries or shops where they could keep warm because they can't afford to stay warm at home. I lift up the churches as well and I pray that we would all be united in our outreach for Christ at this difficult time. I also lift up this church, Hillbank Church, Lord, pray for the members and the friends and the visitors and I thank you for the opportunity to meet together on Sundays as we have been doing for the last couple of months. I've just lift up the missionaries that we support as well Lord. They're far flung in different corners of the world but they're all facing the same threat of coronavirus and it's, it's something else that unites us outside of our faith in Christ. I lift up the leadership here the elders and the deacons who've got tricky decisions to make and awkward situations to navigate. But I pray for their wisdom and I also pray for their protection of their families. I pray for the kids clubs and I thank you that Matty has been able to use the technology that we have available now to enable the One Way Club to continue online for the teenagers. And I thank you for the Globetrotters who are able to meet here physically on Thursdays. I pray that the gospel message will continue to go out to these children 
and teenagers, Lord, and really make a difference. Seeds would be planted, Lord, and that one day they would become part of your family. I pray for the outreaches that we do here at Hillbank, and I especially think of the lighthouse just now, because at this time of year we would traditionally have sought to do a, a, a giving day, a giving day, Lord, and that looks like it's not going to happen this year, or well, certainly not to the same extent that we've done in the past. But we do have plans, Lord. We still want to reach the people of Dundee and get the message of hope out there and into their hands, Lord. So, Father, I just pray that you would give us favour with the support and charities and the funders, and else give us clear direction and open doors, Lord, and give us the opportunity to preach the gospel and the right words to put on our flyer when we put it in the packs that we deliver. Father, I lift up the people of Scotland in general, and I also lift up the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, and her government. I lift up the local authorities who got an awkward job trying to curtail this coronavirus. Father, I lift up the police who have got to try and police it, and it's going to be tricky for them trying to implement travel restrictions. It's also difficult for the NHS, and we thank you for their bravery and their dedication, Lord. I lift up the people in general, and uh, especially those in tier four who really are facing lockdown conditions again. But they're facing lockdown conditions in the middle of winter, and it's not a good time to be hanging about outside in the freezing cold, Lord. Uh, it's not a time to be getting in your garden if you're lucky enough to have one. So it's going to be really tough, Lord. Please sustain this nation. And I pray for the UK. I pray for the unity of the four nations over Christmas time travel. And I also pray for the best possible solution for the Brexit talks. Lord, further afield, I lift up the Holy Land to you. And I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We thank you, God, that the nation of Israel has a home and that your prophetic word is being fulfilled. I pray for the wisdom and tact for Mike Pompeo, the US Secretary of State, during his visits to Judea and the Golan Heights. I lift up the Palestinian, pe Palestinian people, Lord, and their Jewish neighbors, that they would all come to a saving knowledge that Jesus Christ is not only the King of the Jews, but also the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You're coming back soon, Jesus. And only then will genuine lasting peace happen in the promised land. So Maranatha, Lord Jesus. Amen. One of the things that I've really missed during this pandemic is the opportunity to go to gigs and see bands or singer-songwriters that I really like. I'm a bit of a music geek, as my wife Michelle would tell you. And one of the last gigs I was actually able to go to was by the singer-songwriter Nick Cave, who usually plays with a fearsome band called The Bad Seeds. But on this occasion, he was doing something a wee bit different, singing songs solo at the piano, and between songs, taking questions from the audience. It was a really good gig. And a very brave one because Mr Cave didn't know in advance what kind of questions he was going to be asked. Perhaps not surprisingly, given God and religion has always featured strongly in his songs. At one point, Mr Cave was asked a question as to whether he actually believed in God or not. Although by no means a Christian, his response was very interesting and in that he did say that he believed in God and he suggested that for the artist it would be deeply confining to adopt the stance of an atheist and accept that this world simply consists of what we can see around us, that we are simply a matter of flesh and blood living in a purely physical realm. Mr Cave expressed the view that for the artist that universal longing that we all feel, we can all relate to, 
that longing for something greater than ourselves, for something other than ourselves, sits at the very heart of the creative impulse. For the Christian, that universal longing for something more than just a flesh and blood life that has driven so many great composers, songwriters and artists, that longing actually reflects how we were made by our creator. As the author of the Old Testament book, Ecclesiastes, writes, God has set eternity in the human heart. The Christian theologian and writer C.S. Lewis, who we mentioned a wee bit earlier, captures this sense well when he writes, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Christians believe that there is much more to reality than simply flesh and blood, that there is a spiritual aspect to our existence which should not be ignored simply on the basis that we cannot see it with our own eyes. Indeed, as Christians, we would go further and say that to ignore spiritual realities is to condemn yourself to the most horrendous eternal consequences. It is our conviction that the longing that we all feel in our very heart of hearts can only be met by God, that we were created for a relationship with God. All that said, if we're honest, Christian or not, living in a way which acknowledges spiritual realities beyond that which we can see with our own eyes is deeply challenging and something which we're going to try and grapple with for a little while today. I want to read just a couple of verses to you from the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, which really highlights the need for us to not just consider spiritual realities, but to make them absolutely central to how we live our lives in this flesh and blood world. We're going to read from chapter 4 and verse 17 of 2 Corinthians, probably words that are familiar to you if you are a Christian. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is not seen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Fixing our eyes not on what is seen, but what is not seen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Quite a mouthful that. Now that does, when you think about it, sound challenging, doesn't it? To be asked to fix our eyes not upon what we can actually see, but upon that which we can't see. Before we even get to how we might do this, how we might fix our eyes upon what is not seen, we need to ask ourselves first of all, what is it exactly that we're called to fix our eyes upon? The Apostle Paul answers that question for us in a fairly direct manner, and one of his other letters written to the Colossians. This is from Colossians 3 and verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. When Paul writes of fixing our eyes upon that which we cannot see, this is what he means, that our hearts, our minds, should be focused upon Jesus, upon God, upon heavenly things on the understanding that as Christians, we are first and foremost defined in terms of our relationship with God. That our citizenship of his kingdom needs to be central to who we are and how we are to conduct ourselves, whether, rather more important than any other way in which we might define ourselves, whether in terms of political persuasion, race, sex, interests, whatever it might be. This is challenging stuff if you are a Christian, never mind if you're not. But we're called to think about Jesus, but not only in terms of what he's done in the past, but in terms of what he's doing in the present. Set your hearts on things above where Christ, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Is seated, not was seated. You'll notice the present tense. Somehow though, that seems very challenging, doesn't it? Why so? Well, partly because we are influenced by the culture in which we live today, which is dominated by what is sometimes referred to as a materialistic outlook on life. 
an approach which encourages us to believe in what we can see with our own eyes and to distrust that which we cannot see. It's the kind of thinking that often scientists will fall into, that this universe is only material deep, that it is made of purely physical matter, and that any consideration of something beyond that, for example the spiritual realm, something which cannot be tested in a science lab, that should be considered unreliable and probably dismissed. Even as Christians, we can sometimes fall into this way of thinking and can struggle with the idea of the spiritual. In that context, it is little wonder that Christians tend to be more comfortable when we think of the historical flesh and blood Jesus, the one who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on a cross. We can just about manage his resurrection and his ascension to heaven, but after that, I suspect that many of us spend much less time thinking of the ascended Jesus, as it's just much more difficult for us to do that. And if you're not a Christian, you will probably only get as far as Jesus dying on a cross. Whether Christian or not, it's clearly a challenge to think of Jesus in the present as a living person located at the right hand of God. And not only that, but active on our behalf. As the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 7 and verse 23, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus interceding for Christians in the present. Why is it so difficult for us to think of Jesus in the now? Well, we've thought about the influence of our secular culture this materialistic outlook on life. As Paul identifies, we're being asked to fix our eyes upon what is unseen, upon realities that we cannot see in the same way that you can see me just now talking to you. But it's even more than that. To think of Jesus in the present at the right hand of God is to grapple with spiritual realities that we've not yet experienced with our own eyes. Realities that are beyond our visual point of reference. We can just about manage the Jesus who walked this earth because we have relatable points of reference. Jesus became human like us. He encountered and dealt with other human beings like we do. He lived on the same earth that we live now. But Jesus in heaven at the right hand of God, how can we think of such things? But before we even answer that question, consider for a moment how crucial it is that we do consider Jesus in the present. We've been reflecting upon that longing that we have as human beings, a longing which as Christians we believe can only be met through a relationship with God. But if you think about it in very simple terms, a relationship takes place in the present and involves living people. It simply doesn't work if one of the parties is a historical figure who we can only look back upon rather than someone who is here right now and who we can enter into a dialogue with in the present. Someone who can answer the deepest longings of our heart in the here and now. For those of you who have lost loved ones, you will know all too well that the ache in your heartbreak is in not being able to reach out to that person that you love dearly that you miss and not being able to talk to them to hold them to laugh with them and enjoy their company the longing that we have for those that we've lost is not fulfilled by knowing them in the past that's part of the problem and to a far greater extent the same can be said of our relationship with jesus our longing can only be met in a living relationship with jesus in the present Pondering in the historical Jesus will not suffice, and it's not what we are called to. Consider the words of Jesus himself, this from John chapter 15 and verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Our longing can only be met by a living Jesus, but also our effectiveness as a Christian can only ever be achieved 
through a living relationship with Jesus in the present. This is about an ongoing relationship with a living Saviour. For those who are not yet Christians, perhaps you've never considered Jesus in this way before. You've thought of him as exactly that, a distant historical figure, someone who died a long time ago and has little relevance for your life in the present. But the Bible teaches us that Jesus is very much alive, that he is active in the present as much as he, he, he was in the past and will be in the future. A Christian is not someone who is called to practice the rites of some dead religion. A Christian is someone who is called into a vibrant, present day living relationship with the Son of God, Jesus, the only one who can answer the deepest longings of our heart. How then to draw near to the living Jesus? I've been greatly helped in grappling with that question by a book that Matty, our community pastor at Hillbank, loaned out to me called Union with Christ, written by an American pastor called Rankin Wilburn. Matty is very good at loaning out books to me that I actually still need to return. But this particular book, I can't recommend enough to Christians who are thinking and want to be challenged around the nature of their relationship with Jesus. Early on in the book, the author identifies the need for Christians to use their imagination as a means by which they might set their hearts on things above and fix their eyes upon that which is unseen. Now we tend to think of imagination in terms of fantasy, the conjuring up of worlds and characters that are not real, but in that sense imagined. For the materialist determined that the flesh and blood world is all there is to life. It is often to the world of fantasy that he, she will go to meet that longing which simply can't be met in the shallow matter deep world in which that person lives or thinks they live. Little wonder that superheroes and fantasy figures such as Batman, Spider-Man, the Avengers, Harry Potter, Luke Skywalker and the magical worlds they inhabit are so popular and appealing. But of course they're fictional characters set in fictional worlds. I'm hoping by now that you will have already realised that Batman is not a real person, no matter how much you want him to be. You're not Batman either. But what if that longing for the magical, for the wonderful, for the out of this world could actually be met in reality in a far greater way? A relationship with God himself, with the creator of everything and everyone, wouldn't that be something? Rankin Wilburn encourages us to use our imagination as Christians, not in the fantasy sense, but in another way, to image or visualise that which we cannot see with our own eyes, but which is nevertheless 100% real. He identifies that we cannot possibly follow Paul's instruction to fix our eyes upon that which is unseen, without using our imagination in this sense, to picture that which we cannot yet see with the naked eye. Indeed, Rankin points out that our use of imagination in this sense is a crucial part of the Christian experience. That to use his own words, believing the gospel means having your imagination taken captive and shaped by a new story. A real story, but nevertheless an incredible and remarkable one which focuses upon Jesus as the central character, someone who is wonderfully beyond our comprehension in so many ways. But still, using our imagination, our imagination rather, in this way, is still going to be very challenging, isn't it? Especially in the world in which we live, which generally dismisses such an approach. To return to the materialistic outlook we've already considered, the general consensus of our secular society is that we should trust and believe only in what we can see with the naked eye and dismiss underlying spiritual realities, which cannot be discerned in such a straightforward way. That there is no spiritual dimension to our lives, it is all simply as we see it with our own eyes. We're encouraged to believe that anything which involves the use of our imagination 
to visualise that which we cannot see with the naked eye is not to be trusted as real and instead should probably be dismissed as fantasy. But we're not only discouraged from using our imagination in this way, we're also distracted from doing so in a world that's saturated with social media, with the banalities of Facebook, with the invitation to scroll endlessly to see what Tommy's had for his tea, what Samantha thinks about the coronavirus, what Fred is watching on TV, etc, etc. We live in a world of information overload, where we can be watching 24 hour news, all kinds of sports channels, we can binge box sets on Netflix, view all kinds of websites to fulfil all kinds of curiosities and desires. It would be fair to say that this is a world which diminishes our ability to use our imagination in the kind of disciplined way which Rankin Wilburn and indeed the Apostle Paul lay out as a necessary part of the Christian experience. A world which encourages us towards a kind of attention deficit disorder approach to life, where we check our phones, speak to our loved ones, watch the news and do housework all at the same time, without giving our hearts and minds over to a particular focus. Yet applying our hearts and minds to this seeking of Jesus is exactly what we're called to, to, called to rather, as Christians. And indeed, if you're not a Christian, but you're curious about Jesus, someone who wants to know the truth, then you will have to apply yourself to your investigation. A half-hearted cursory glance at Jesus and the things of Jesus will not suffice. It's not an option to try and do this in a distracted fashion, hand in hand with a whole lot of other things. Rather, it is something that we must give ourselves over to. So how to do it then? How do we use our imagination to visualise that which we cannot see, to consider heavenly realities in an unheavenly present? Well, of course, first of all, none of this would be possible were it not for the fact that we're enabled by God, by his Holy Spirit living within us, who inclines our hearts towards these realities, towards Jesus and what he has done, is doing and will do, for us as encompassed by his love for us. As we begin our Christian lives, so we continue. If you're watching today and you're not a Christian, you may have never seriously considered the claims of Jesus, that he is the Son of God, that only those who turn from themselves and put their trust in him as their saviour will have their relationship with God made right. But maybe you're considering it now. Maybe you're realising that you're a sinner, in need of rescue before a holy God, and that only Jesus can effect that rescue. If you do have a sense of these things, it's because God is working in your life right now and is leading you to see yourself for who you are, to see God for who he is, and crucially to see Jesus for who he really is, for what he has done, what he is doing in the present and what he will do in the future. If you hear that call today, then heed it. Take the opportunity before you. There are no guarantees that you will hear it again. In the words of the Apostle Paul, I tell you, now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. And so it is that as we are called into a relationship with Jesus, so we continue, led by God, enabled by his Holy Spirit, to see that which is unseen. This is a recurring theme in the Apostle Paul's writing. I'll give you just one example. We read, we read this from his letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians 3 and verse 17. And I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is about real experiences of heavenly realities, of Jesus himself, and it is initiated by God rather than us. But that doesn't mean that we are to sit back and wait for God to do something to us. No, we are called to think in these things, to consider the living Jesus who will return one day as conquering king. We are indeed to use our God-enabled imagination to focus on these things. 
So again, returning to the question of how to do so, let me finish today with just a couple of practical pointers, mindful of the discouragements and the distractions that this world often throws at us. I've got three very contrived words beginning with P for your consideration. Firstly, protected time. We need to put aside daily time where we can meet with God. What many of us would refer to as a quiet time. Time where we can focus upon God alone, where we can read the Bible, where we can pray and meditate on his word. Time during which we can give ourselves over to this pursuit without being distracted by mobile phones or the TV or where possible other people. Now as someone who lives with a wife, a three-year-old daughter and what I can only describe as two deeply disturbed dogs, I know how difficult that can be. And that's not even to consider my own propensity towards distraction, towards thinking about and doing other things. Sometimes compromises will need to be made. There's a danger, isn't there, that we can become too precious about how quiet our quiet time needs to be. That it just doesn't happen at all if the circumstances aren't quite right for us. And that's no good. So we need to be realistic and consider our own living situations. It may be early morning, it may be in the evening when the kids are in bed. It might be whilst your kids are watching cartoons, but it'll be a time where distractions will be at a minimum to allow you to enter into that space where you can meditate, where you can use your imagination to help you to get to grips with what you're reading in the Bible, to think about what God has to say to you, to see that which is unseen. Protected time. Secondly, prepared time. In the sense of being prepared to exercise our minds, clearly to use our imagination in this way is going to involve effort on our part. So we can't simply read the Bible as we might a novel just before we go to sleep at night in a kind of mindless, sleepy days. And I say that as someone who has done exactly that in the past. My wife, Michelle, makes me laugh when I think about this because she, like me, reads before going to sleep. But often she finds the next evening that she has to reread chapters because she can't actually remember what she's read the previous night. When we come to the Bible, we have to be ready to think, to use our minds to understand what we're reading and to consider what it tells us about God and ourselves. We can't just hurriedly read another couple of chapters, throw in a quick prayer and be on our way. We need to consider what we've read, mull it over, grapple with it and pray about it. It may well be that much of this process will take place beyond our quiet time, through our day, as we revisit what we read in our minds and pray about. It won't always be an easy process. In fact, my own experience is that it's often challenging and difficult. Which brings me on to my third P, purposeful time. Why are we having these times to read the Bible, to meditate on what it says to us, to pray? Out of a sense of duty, a sense of obligation, because we know we're meant to read the Bible, so we make ourselves do this reluctantly. No, because ultimately we're expecting to meet God, to hear what he has to say to us, to learn from him about who he is, who we are, what we are to do in our, his service, how we are to do it, and so forth and so on. We're putting aside time during which our relationship with God might be nurtured, developed. The writer of Psalm 119 captures the nature of this process succinctly when he writes, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Ultimately, the Bible brings us to Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Our eyes, hearts and minds need to be orientated towards him. That is the challenge that we are called to in this lifetime. We need to use our imagination to this end. And of course, beyond this lifetime, our need to use our imagination will be replaced by actual face-to-face -face contact when we will see Jesus more clearly than you can see me on this screen. Quite a thought. If you're a Christian, that will be a wonderful day. For now, we see only a reflection as a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. 
My hope for you and me is that we would cultivate our relationship with the living Jesus in the present, more and more each day until that day when we meet him face to face. There's something to use your imagination to think about. And if you don't know, yet know Jesus, consider him today. Consider this living saviour available to all those who would turn from themselves and put their trust in him, recognising that he is the only one who can put you in a right relationship with God. And in doing so, he will answer the deepest longings of your heart. Let me finish with another quote from C.S. Lewis, who is a way of encapsulating the wonder of the Christian experience. This is really what a relationship with Jesus is all about, what it can and will be. We do not want merely to see beauty. We want something else which can hardly be put into words, to be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. Jesus is ultimately the answer to any question we might ask. Please get in touch if you want to discuss any of this with us. We would be delighted to hear from you. Amen. We're going to hear from the praise man now. We're going to be playing a hymn called All I Once Held Dear. A hymn that reminds us that ultimately the deepest longings of our heart can only be met by Jesus. After which I will close our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a gracious and kind God that you want to have a relationship with your creations. We'd ask, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to be aware of our need of the Lord Jesus. For those of us who know Jesus, that we would strive to know him better, that we would want to spend time learning about him, that we would want to spend time with him. And for those of us that do not know Jesus, that we would recognise our need of the Saviour, that we would put our trust in the only one that can put us into a right relationship with God. We'd ask Heavenly Father that you would help each one of us, regardless of our circumstances. And we pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen.